Okay, so um, I'd like to get started with uh, a kind of a different uh, phase field model, uh, not a kind of a very different phase field model, and it's much newer than the phase field models that we have been discussing through the uh, through the quarter uh, through the quarter through the last four lectures, five lectures, and um, and in fact, it's probably only about eight eight years old or so, so it's relatively new. And so people are still trying to understand its strengths and weaknesses. And so what I want to try to give you is a, is a um, my opinion or my take on its strengths and weaknesses and some open problems that still have to be addressed. This is joint work that I've done with uh, I, uh, Yamanaka Alster Reynolds. Um, um, Akinori is at the um, in Tokyo at the Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology. Eli Alster is a graduate student and. Kevin uh, McReynolds is at NIST as a postdoc now. So I'll, I'll give you an introduction to the, crea uh, the phase field model, some of our more recent work, um, and then close with some um, oops, close with some uh, future uh, future outlook on. So uh, what what is the um, what is the motivation for uh, phase field crystal models? And so if you look at um, classical molecular dynamics simulation, you've seen this picture before. This is from Mark Osta. And Jeff Hoyt. Um, this is a, a, a molecular dynamic simulation of a, a copper aluminum, and this is the liquid that's a solid. And what you can see is that the liquid is highly disordered, and the and the um, and the uh, crystal quite ordered. These are molecular dynamic simulations, and so that means that these uh, simulations occur on lattice vibration time scales, so picoseconds, femtosecond time steps, and so a, a massively long molecular dynamics simulation will be a microsecond, right? And so the uh, typical materials, however, evolve over much longer time scales. And so the question has always been, and the problem has always been from the molecular dynamics community, is how do you get around this uh, lattice vibration time scale? Oops. And one way to do that is to say, well, let's, let's look at this crystal and we'll go in here and we'll put our finger at a point in the crystal and we'll time average the density at a particular point, like here. And then you go down to here and you put a, a value, that, that value of the density down here. And you go up here and you time average the density at a point and you bring it down to here. And, and since the liquid atoms move around there, don't sit on lattice points, the density is approximately uniform. In the lattice, um, the, the atoms sit on lattice sites, so you have high peaks in the density at the lattice sites and troughs around those peaks. Uh, where you don't have any uh, atoms. And that's the basic idea between a phase field crystal model because once you've, uh, once you've integrated out these lattice vibration time scales, everything else is basically can be written in terms of the motion uh, or, or the time average, the, the flow of atomic density without worrying about these, these, these time average fluctuations. So, so you, you basically can evolve the system on these diffusional time scales because you not, no longer have to worry about this but you retain the atomic resolution that you see of, of the crystal. And so how do you construct a phase, field mod, a phase field crystal model? And now I think everyone in this room can now do this because I think you'll see exactly how to do this. So we, we're all familiar with um, traditional phase field models. I don't really have to go into them here for this audience. This is the bulk free energy. That's the interface free energy. That's the gradient energy coefficient. Um, and the composition through the interface is the average of the uh, the the uh, trade-off of those two energies. Okay, so how do you do a phase field crystal model? So you start with the uh, uh, the Con Hilliard functional, and then you change the sign of the gradient energy coefficient to be negative. And and if you remember from your simulations that you did at the very beginning, when you change the sign of the diffusion coefficient, you ended up with a dispersion relation that said that the growth of the uh, the growth rate of the fluctuation k goes to infinity is infinity, and you end up with with things that look like this. So this is doing exactly the same thing because what it says is that as I create gradients, the energy goes down. And so if you create if the energy goes down as you create gradients, you end up with a system that has lots of gradients that look like this, infinite gradients, and and that's obviously not very good. But then what you can do is you can say, well, let's let's see if we can take care of the, the divergence of the of the gradients are going to infinity, and um, let's add a let's add a um, a term up here, another term, where this is the curvature of the uh, of the order parameter field, and you notice what's happening here. 
Here the curvature is diverging to infinity, right? You have a point. And so you say, well, let's, let's put a curvature term in here and let's put a positive sign so it increases the energy. So basically it says that it doesn't like this curve, this, this kind of curvature. But if you look at it here, so this is, this, it likes this curvature, but the curvature changes sign up there. And so you still have the same problem that you'll get rid of this problem, but you'll still have the problem at the peaks with the curvature in the other direction. And so you simply have to square it like this. And now instead of getting something that looks like that, you'll get something that looks like this. And so what happens is that rather than getting um, uh, hyperbolic tangent profiles or anything like, or something that we've got with the classic phase field model, here what you get is a periodic pattern. And this periodic pattern is related to the curvature that you, the, the energies of the curvatures that you set down here, and the gradient energy coefficient that likes things to be very high in gradient and now because you've changed the sign here. And so it's the, this, this length scale is related to these two coefficients that sit in front of the free energy functional there. So if you take that free energy function that looks, uh, that looks just like, um, uh, that basically comes from the Allen Kahn free energy functional, if you take a, a, a double well free energy, this looks exactly like the double well free energy that we've had before. You notice there's no cubic term in this. Um, it's just a square and a quartic. Um, with Q0 here actually is the length scale of the, of the sine wave that I showed you before, the wave number of the length scale, the wave number. And epsilon is a parameter. So if you put that bulk free energy into the free energy function up there, integrate by parts a couple of times, um, and you get the, uh, what's called the swift holmberg equation, which is originally postulated for um, pattern formation in fluids during convection. But the, uh, it's, it's basically the simplest kind of model that you can think of that gives you a pattern. And so you have this, in the, in the liquid it's featureless, the density of the liquid is featureless, it's uniform, and as you go into the solid you begin to get fluctuations where you have peaks at the lattice positions. And I drew this picture a couple hours, an hour ago, right? When we were talking, when I asked this question, when I was asked this question about why only one order parameter. The order parameter that we're kind of thinking of when we write our uh, uh, phase field model is the, is the envelope of this. And this is, in fact, one way, to, one way to take the periodic pattern you get from these equations and map it into a phase field, a phase field model. Um, if you look at this equation up here, so it's, this is the Laplacian uh, squared twice, so this is the fourth order, this is a biharmonic operator up here when you apply this operator twice. So it's a biharmonic-like equation in, in the energy, in the energy, not in the evolution equation. And so you can look at the uh, energy minimum of these states. So you have a, a liquid here and a solid. Um, this is the kind of phase diagram uh, you get. This, this, is, this should really be epsilon here. Um, so at high temperatures, you get a constant phase. You get a triangular phase, which is what I showed over here. This is basically um, a hexagonal lattice in two dimensions. Um, and a liquid over here, and you have a two-phase coexistence. There are other phases that come into play here. This is a stripe phase. And, and these various phases... Um, uh, are, are not important, so tri uh, stripe phases are not important in terms of crystals, but the same model has been used by the polymers community for block copolymers, and it's called the Brzozowski functional. And in fact, you do see stripes in, in polymer systems, but we're interested in crystals, so we'll, we'll neglect that. And so um, that's, what it's, that's what the stripe phase looks like, the stripe phase, um, triangular phase coexistence. So the, the problem with this model, as I, as I put it, as I, as I showed you so far, is that it, it gives you something, that, a pattern that looks like a crystal, but it could, that could be uh, convection rolls. I mean, wh where's the physics of the real problem? And so the, the thing that really kind of, I think, changed the direction of the field and made people realize that there's actually some physics in this is some work that, um, that uh, Pravadas and Elder did a couple of years ago where they looked at classical density functional theory. And in classical density functional theory, you write the uh, free energy as a function of n, 
So this is the density of atoms at a particular location R. Um, and you can see this is one, uh, 1 plus n log 1 plus n. So this kind of looks like a regular, uh, the, I, the, the uh, entropy of mixing term, like an entropy of mixing term. And then you have an enthalpic term that in an ad, that the way you capture this in an enthalpic term is you say if I have a, a density of atoms at a particular R, with the density of atoms at a particular R prime, they interact with each other by this, this two-point correlation function, which tells you how fast that in, the interaction is between the atoms. Um, and this n is a relative density, as I said, density at one point minus some average. Um, and so this is just classical density functional theory. But what you can do is um, minimize that, that energy, and you end up with a density profile in a crystal that looks very much like this. So you have these very, very sharp Gaussian peaks at each of the lattice points, which is exactly what you want, with no density in between. Um, and even though this, this density field evolves on diffusional time scales, um, if you think about doing this in a spectral um, method, you need a lot of, uh, a, a, a huge number of wave of uh, modes or wave numbers in order to be able to capture the fact that you have near zero density out here and a peak in the density profile here. So the, the, the problem was that, that, that uh, the peaks were so narrow that um, you, you had to use so many modes that basically it's more efficient to just do molecular dynamics than it is to solve these equations. So even though you got around the time step problem, you still have this density profile problem that kind of killed you. However, if you expand um, the, uh, the entropic term um, to first order, to uh, fourth order in the uh, density, you can see that's beginning to look a little bit like one of these Ginsburg-Landau functionals that, that we write down for phase field, except now it has a cubic term which in this case they set to zero. So you just get the two squared, the squared and the fourth. And you expand the, this correlation function about the peak of the structure function in a liquid. And so this is what you measure from experiments. This is a structure function, the amplitude of the, of the uh, density of, of, of the liquid at a particular wave number kind of looks like this thing until it got basically at long distance, long wave numbers, you get to the average density of the liquid. But the short range interactions between the atoms are captured by this first peak. And so you, you, you fit this with a parabola, essentially, about, about k0. So you basically expand that to second order in the wave number. And if you put that back in there with that expansion, lo and behold, you get back the swift holmberg model. But now with this epsilon related to a physical measurable quantity, the structure function of the second derivative of the, of the two-point correlation function. And so you can link these two things together now, showing that, well, maybe there is some physics uh, in, in, this, in this problem. So one of the things you want to, one of the things, you, essentially, so, so what you're doing is you're doing this expansion. So you're basically, n, for small n, you're basically saying that the density is close to the average density. So you have fluctuations, but they're close. And so what we're doing is we're replacing that um, those uh, sharp Gaussians, or nearly delta function peaks, with, with that. So, so we're, we're replacing the sharp Gaussians with a, um, uh, a, a, a function that doesn't require a large number of wave numbers in order to be able to simulate. Um, and, it, and it varies in space uh, in a periodic fashion to give you the lattice. But the important thing that you, I want to make sure everyone understands is that this is the real picture. This is the approximation, and you can see that the approximation does a pretty bad job with the density in between atoms, right? It's, um, that's a problem. And, and, every, and so what I'm going to be showing you is pictures of, of the evolution of, of atoms in phase field, or with phase field crystals, and you're going to be kind of drawn to the, your attention because of the, the color scale that you use to these peaks. But you have to remember that the density in between the peaks is non-zero, and really what we're doing here is, is looking at something that's... Uh, like a sine function almost, in, in many cases it is. So it's a small perturbation about n. So, so the real question here is how well can it do? Can you, could, can you do real materials with this? And this is something that I um, uh, borrowed from Ken Elder. And, and the, the idea here is to fit um, the energy function, to create the energy function, or the approximation to the energy function that goes in to the, uh, to the correlation function I showed you there before at the beginning. 
And so um, let's do this. So, so those are the surface energies between solid and liquid at various crystallographic orientations. This is what the experiment or that you get from experimenter MD. And these here are various fits to that structure function. So if you do a five parameter fit to the structure function, you get an interface surface energy of 207 ergs per centimeter squared. You notice real units here, right? These are not, these are not dimensionless, 207. If you do a better job of fitting to the uh, structure function, you get 165 uh, joules, per meter square, joules per centimeter squared, which is closer to what the real number is. And the anisotropy um, we get is, they get is about 1.3%. Uh, uh, um, if you look at the bulk properties, like the expansion on melting, this bulk modulus, the liquid modulus, again, as you put in more parameters, you get a better and better fit to the experiment. And so this is very much like um, what you do when you create classical potentials for molecular dynamics, right? You, you have a, 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 an embedded atom um, potential, and you have to fit all the coefficients in the embedded atom potential in order to match to certain properties. We're kind of doing the same thing, same thing here. Um, this is from some work of Alan Karma and uh, Mark Asta. So this is the density profile uh, across a solid-liquid interface. Here is the uh, the peaks in the density profile of the lattice basins, uh, lattice points, and the, and they, they decay slowly as you go into the liquid. You can see the perturbations here; they eventually decay away. So you can you can um, look at the envelope of that function that goes into the liquid. So this is the periodic function of the lattice. This is an amplitude function that varies slowly from one position to another where z here is across the interface. And so you get an amplitude function that goes smoothly from one phase to another. This is what you get from um, molecular dynamics, the black ones. And the other two are what you get from uh, amplitude expansion of the phase field crystal model or Ginsburg-Landau theory. So it captures the width of the interface in a, in a reasonable way. But if you, if you really want to work hard and expand the structure to eighth order, in, in FCC, this comes from some work um, by a Finnish group of uh, uh, Tapio Alanasala. Um, you can uh, look at the energy of grain boundaries. And so this is the energy of a grain boundary. And notice that there's a scale here, joules per meter squared, right? This is not dimensional. This is a function of the tilt angle. So you're looking at the angle as a function of misorientation um, across a grain boundary. Um, down here, you have the uh, uh, reed shockley model over here. And then you have this complicated energy surface. Here's a special boundary. This is a sigma-3 uh, type boundary there. Um, and, you, and you pick up uh, an energy surface that's similar to what you get when you do molecular dynamic simulations. And so this comes right out of the phase field crystal model. You don't put this in. You just measure the energies. So what is the what is the problem with the Swift with the um, with the uh, Swift Holmberg model? Well, the, one of the major problems with the Swift Holmberg model is that you can only get hexagonal crystals or BCC crystals in three dimensions. So you either get hexagonal crystals in two D or um, BCC crystals in three D. And so how do you how do you begin to put in other um, other crystal structures, other more complicated uh, objects? And what, uh, what a group in, uh, um, in, in Canada, but Nick Provatis and Mike Greenwood did, and Jörg Rottler, he's at uh, UBC, um, put in a, um, what they did is they just left this two-point correlation function, and you construct what that two-point correlation function is in Fourier space, because you solve all these equations in Fourier space anyway. And so what you do is you, you just basically create a two-point correlation function with peaks in the um, Gaussians, in Fourier space, where you want basically the, the atoms to be. So you just put them in, in, in Fourier space. And using this, they were able to get some more complicated crystal structures, or even simpler ones like, like simple cubic. Another approach is to, um, is to uh, add higher order terms in real space. And so this is the real space representation. This is the swift holmberg you add other gradient terms here to the n, where you put in as many as you like. And using that, you can get uh, this approach. You can get uh, face center cubic. You can get square lattices. 
and you can actually get uh, all the Brave lattices in, in two dimensions using using that using that approach. So um, we've worked a little bit on creating complex crystal structures, and we start with a, we started with a a, um, a theory due to Seymour and Provatus where we started we had both the uh, the entropy of mixing term here, the two point correlation function here, and we actually used three point correlation functions in an approximate way that still allowed you to do the calculations quickly in Fourier space. And so you decompose the complicated three point correlation function into a, pro into a sum of the products of three point correlation functions at R1 and R2. So you, can basically, you basically do convolutions of the, uh, of the functions. And so what uh, Eli did is he said, well, what we can do is we can use this idea to, to fix the angles between planes in, um, in using the three-point correlation functions. So you use the two-point to set the distances. In other words, where you put the peaks of the Gaussians, and then you use the three points in order to fix the angles between the planes. And using that approach, you can generate reasonably complicated crystal structures using a by looking at the structure functions of the crystal structures themselves. So this is a theta prime um, and aluminum copper alloys um, over here. These are not really aluminum and copper. I'll explain how, how you actually put in the differences of composition in a little bit. But you can create this, um, basically this calcium fluoride type structure using this approach. Um, and the reason why you, the reason why you need the three-point correlation function is that, is that um, if you if you put peaks in the two point correlation functions at these crystal structure crystal locations, they they're the same basically for uh, F FCC, and so you can't get the this calcium fluoride structure, which is why you needed to um, choose this three point correlation function with a certain Legendre polynomials in order to get the the right angles, and I, I won't I won't go belabor that. So. Um, you can get uh, disordered um, calcium fluoride, simple cubic, diamond cubic, graphene layers, and, we've, and Eli has also been successful in getting this perovskite-like structure too. Perovskite-like, but perovskite structure. So you have to put atoms on these these sub lattices um, for for the for the theta prime, for example. And we've worked as well as to take the uh, base field crystal models that allow you to do uh, ordered structures, and so. Um, here you can, you can use a phase field crystal model to do a first order A2, B2 uh, ordering transformation or a second order um, A2, B2 transformation between, uh, between two crystals. And so this is composition, this is temperature. At high phases, high temperatures is disordered, at low phases it's ordered. And you can use this model to actually decorate that, uh, that, that lattice to get the compounds of, of interest. Okay, so, so let me kind of return now to, to what the basic philosophy is. And so um, if you think about classical potentials for molecular dynamics, you have to fit, you have, these are ad hoc functions that are created sometimes using some knowledge of the physics um, in order to give you the properties of the material that you're interested in. And this can be really challenging. So one of the examples of this is that if you use uh, Stillinger-Weber potentials, for example, uh, for silicon, you get very reasonably good um, uh, results for the properties of bulk silicon. But if you want to you look at silicon vacuum surfaces, you tend to use ter Tersoff potentials. And it's the same material, silicon, but you use different potentials depending upon whether you're interested in surfaces or the bulk. Okay? And so the PFC problem is similar, where you take free energy functions and you tune the free energy functions to give you the properties of interest. Maybe they're the mechanical properties, maybe they're the surface energies, but you, you have to tune these free energy functions or these correlation functions to give you the, the stru crystal structures and the properties of, of interest. And so in that sense, it's very much like choosing or developing um, classical, classical potentials. And so um, the dynamics looks just like any old phase field model, right? So you take a free energy functional, this is the in the typical. This is the uh, swift hollenberg up here. Um, you demand that the energy decrease and that uh, the number of atoms is conserved. So everyone knows this now, cold, because we discussed this. And so you take the variational derivative of this this thing that's just a crank, and this is just crank that out. It's just you just turn the crank, and this is what you get. Um, 
So I want to point out one thing with this, this equation. So this is a diffusion type equation. Uh, the, the, the mobility term here has been put into the time scale. It's dimensionless. The length scale is chosen such that it's equal to the uh, equilibrium lattice parameter. That's why there's a one there. Um, but I want to look, I want to first uh, point out the order of the derivatives here. So this is, there's two orders of space here. There's four orders in space here. So this is six order in space. This is a very, very stiff equation. So you will see when you solve the Con Hilliard equation how painful it is to do this using finite differences. Here it's six order and this is the simplest model. As you add more physics, as you add all of those extra fits, the, 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 uh, all the better fits to the structure function that I talked about, they keep adding these higher, these higher derivatives if you want to do the computation in real space. And so that all of the calculations I'll be showing you here are done in Fourier space. They're all being done spectrally. So they're periodic domains and it allows you to do these calculations reasonably quickly. Um, one of the problems with this model is that the atoms evolve on diffusional time scales. Um, but but if, if you wanted to look at, uh, let's say, elasticity or dislocations, dislocations come right out of this model naturally, as you'll see. Um, you can make, uh, you can put a higher order time derivative here with it that allows you to separate the time scales for the evolution of the elastic waves to the uh, evolution of the uh, flow due to diffusion. So you can actually make this look like a wave equation. So you can get elastic waves in the structure too if you wanted to. So let me kind of illustrate for those, you probably haven't seen this, excuse me, seen these, any of these results before. So, so let me just kind of illustrate here uh, with, uh, oh yeah, so I'm going to show you evolution problems and I'm going to be solving this equation. Just a simple, simple um, uh, swift holmberg like equation. And so the first thing you do is to say, well, well does it give you um, uh, the sharp interface result, okay? It's the equivalent of the sharp interface result. So here we take a, a grain boundary and we watch, we watch the energy of the grain boundary as a function of misorientation between the, over the grain boundary. And for small angles, small misorientation angles, you have the classic reed shockley result, which is up here, which is the grain boundary energy, these are dimensionless numbers now, as a function of the misorientation here, uh, varies like that. Um, goes like uh, theta log theta. Uh, e is the elastic, mo is the ela Young's modulus of the crystal. B is the Burgers vector. These dots are what we get from the phase field crystal model. This red line is, the, is that equation where we use the phase field crystal model to, to, to uh, measure the elastic modulus of the crystal. And we use B here, capital B, as a fitting parameter. And you, get the, you get that. So it, so it, recap it captures Reed Shockley. Um, the other thing that, that I want to emphasize here is, is how grain boundaries are different than um, soap froths. And one of the reasons why grain boundaries are different so, than soap froths is that there's a coupling between deformation um, and the grain boundary motion as a result of the continuity of the lattice. And so if you have a, uh, a bicrystal here, this is the grain boundary. The lattice planes are continuous across, some of the lattice planes are continuous for a low angle grain boundary. And I'll show you pictures of that in a second. Um, and if you take that bicrystal and you shear it like this, like I've shown with the arrows, um, you would get a situation that looked like that. If so, if you had sliding on the grain boundary, that's what it would look like. If you, if, if however, these two, uh, these two planes have to remain continuous or coherent, the only way you can get that or keep that coherency is for the boundary to migrate. And so now that plane is continuous. And so there's a, a, a coupling between the deformation or the displacement this way and the motion of the boundary this way. So the tangential motion of the boundary and the normal motion of the boundary are coupled by some sort of constant that's just related to the misorientation angle between the two grains. And so let's look at the ramifications of that. So this is a, a single grain in the phase field crystal simulation. Um, here are the peaks in the density profile. This little, this grain in here is misoriented with respect to this one by about five degrees. And you can see that some of the planes are continuous across the boundary here, and some are not. These things are dislocations that kind of appear naturally. So the way we did these calculations, we took the inner, inner grain, we rotated it by five degrees, and then we let it sit, and um, 
you ended up with a, with a grain structure, a dislocation structure that looked like this. And now we can put this into motion. And the, the uh, grain boundaries, the, uh, the dislocations move, the grain uh, disappears, and this is a really pretty good, pretty, pretty nice projector actually. So look, look at what's happening to the grain in the middle, right? So when the grain disappears, you can kind of see it jump. And if you remember from um, your elementary uh, uh, structures class, that the misorientation between the grain, uh, the, gra the misorientation across the grain boundary and a low angle grain boundary, is related to the, the ratio of the Berger's vector to the distance between dislocations. And um, if you look at that picture there, you can see that the distance between the dislocations is getting smaller and smaller as a function of time, right? So this thing is getting smaller as a function of time. This is a constant, that's the Berger's vector. And so the, this misorientation angle must be going up as the, as the structure goes down, as the structure shrinks. And so what this means is that we start the, we start the, um, we start the simulation at this angle over here, let's say, and as time goes on, the angle, misorientation angle goes up because the spacing between the dislocations change and the energy of the system actually goes up. The energy of the grain boundary actually goes up. And so um, one way to see that, if you don't uh, remember your uh, dislocation, property of dislocations, is by looking at this picture here. So here are the continuous lattice planes across the, uh, across the crystal. If you allow that, to, uh, that crystal to shrink, this comes from a picture of John, John Conn and John Taylor, so you, Gene Taylor. So you let that, the inner grain shrink. Um, again, just like I showed you in the, in the planar boundary case, if you want those boundaries to be uh, continuous across, want the planes to be continuous across the boundary, that has to rotate. And so you have to get this rotation as the grain shrinks. And so this on the right is a, a grain, and, that, and this is the misorientation angle. And you can see that as it shrinks, the misorientation angle actually uh, increases. And so it is in fact rotating. That's exactly what, what you would predict. And we didn't put that into the phase field crystal model. It just came out, right? It just, there's nothing, there's nothing that we, uh, and uh, just to convince you that this is not a new result, um, these are some uh, molecular dynamics simulations by uh, Mich Trout and Mission. Those are probably the most recent ones, the very nice ones. But there are also earlier ones by Upenu and uh, Strolovitz uh, a couple of years back, um, and John Kahn and Taylor, uh, and uh, uh, Warren and Carter. Um, and you also see these, these kind of uh, uh, rotations. Actually, this, this rotation is not limited to small angle boundaries. It's, you actually see it for large angle boundaries, too. That's some of your emissions work. OK. So let me, look about the, let me talk about the structure of uh, uh, what happens in three dimensions. So if you look at a low angle boundary in BCC crystals, um, so you take a BCC crystal and another BCC crystal and you rotate them and you put them together. So this is a twist boundary. This is, this is what you get. And if you look at Hearth and Lotha, this is a picture from Hearth and Lotha where you end up with that, mis that twist boundary can be taken up by an array of screw dislocations uh, with a certain Berger's vector and a certain dislocation line. Um, these, these quadra junctions are unstable, and so they split up into um, hexagonal array. The quadra junctions disappear, replaced by hexagonal array of dislocations with, that are 100 and 111 types, with Berger's vectors given, given there. And this is, this is actually observed in experiments. So those are, the, uh, that, those are low angle twist boundaries in iron. You can see the, the beautiful hexagonal like nets of these structures. So what we did in, in uh, these three-dimensional simulations is that we took a, a big crystal on the top, a big crystal on the bottom, we rotated, we rotated, and we wanted to look at the structure. So, so these, these, are, these calculations um, involve a, a computational box that's about 680 cubed. This is done on a GPU, one GPU, um, primarily because the FFTW runs really fast on one GPU. Is, is, <laughs> who knows? Um, okay. So if you look down in the top, this is the dislocation net. 
Those are the Burgers vectors, 111 and uh, 100 Burgers vectors. And those are the lines of the dislocations. And so you get pretty much exactly as you expect with uh, Burgers vectors uh, parallel to the, dis to the dislocation lines. If you rotate a little bit higher, so the misorientation increases, the spacing between the dislocations decreases, and you still get a nice net of dislocations. Um, and sometimes you just haven't run it, run it long enough, but you can even see quadrature junctions, which is basically what the initial condition was. So those will eventually split up into those two types of dislocations. Oh, okay, here's here's the uh, their um, six twenty seven cubed grids using a, a GPU. And so what we do now is we go into the crystal, we rotate about one one zero, the one one zero in this case, the one one zero direction, and we create a spherical grain, and we can see whether we get the same sort of dependence of the of the. Uh, oh yeah, so if if you rotate about an axis here, right? So you. are up here, it's a, it's, you're rotating this way. So up here, you're going to have screw dislocations along the bottom, along the mid rim, uh, along the center down here, perpendicular to this. You'll end up with edge dislocations. So this is looking, uh, looking uh, right along the one, one, 110 direction. So you have a, uh, an array of screw dislocations, uh, dislocation net. But if you rotate the particle, you can see that you have uh, uh, different kinds of dislocations. So you have the nets on both sides, and then you have the edge dislocations that connect these nets. And this came right out of the phase field crystal simulation. These are the Burgers vectors of various types of dislocations, but you can see that right along the mid of the particle, the Burgers vector is perpendicular to the line, whereas up here in both ends, the Burgers vectors are parallel with the line, so you get screw dislocations. Okay. Um, and so now we can put this into motion. So this is with a four degree rotation about 110, and you can see that the, the dislocations evolve, the grain disappears, but it does this in a very non-symmetric um, way. It looks like the edge dislocation, the, the dislocations of the, uh, in the dislocation nets, the screw dislocations evolve much, much faster than the edge dislocations. And so you end up with these two nets coming close to each other, coming down, and then uh, changes in the morphology of the particle. This is a little more obvious when, if we look at the density peaks. Um, you can see that the, 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 the the particle actually be develops facets that are parallel to the dislocation lines. And then those facets will disappear. It will become a little more, and you can see uh, more and more circular in this, but, but you can see that it looks like a disc in the other direction. It looks like an ellipsoid. So it's, it's a very different, uh, very different morphology from what you'd expect. It's not, it's not a spherical morphology at all. And that's because you have this, uh, the dislocation network coming down in the top, that's very different than what's happening on, on the sides. And all of this comes out of the, that simple little evolution equation I wrote. So again, we, we want to make sure that the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the PFC is doing something reasonable. So we looked at the dislocation reactions. Um, and so this is the, we're going to focus on the reactions that occur um, on the sides as these two networks begin to come together. So is this position A. So A actually wraps around from the top to the side. So here's A. And, we, and what happens is that this dislocation disappears. And let me just blow that up here. So what happens is that the, the dislocation at the, at the top, uh, you can see the blue dislocation, the one, 100 dislocation disappears. You form a, a, an unstable quadrant junction that then breaks up. And all of these reactions can serve the Burgers vector. So it's doing exactly what you would expect for a classical dislocation uh, reaction problem. And eventually these things, uh, these little loops disappear because, uh, and then you, uh, which is possible because, the, because it's a loop. And then, and then you just end up with dislocation lines that then proceed. So if you look at the higher misorientation, the spacing between the dislocations is smaller, but you see something kind of, reminiscent, I guess. You still see this faceting, unfastening uh, kind of uh, process that you 
that you see, but you can see that you still have this highly anisotropic like shape. Um, and actually the code that we use to do the visualizations is the same code that people use to do molecular dynamics simulations, to visualize molecular dynamics simulations. So do we get rotation in three dimensions? And so um, that's one of the, that's what we we're looking at here. So this is the area uh, of the, um, the surface area of the grain is a function of time. It shrinks for 15 degree misorientation here, rather high misorientation. It's a straight line for lower misorientations. There may be slight deviations from this. But the important point that, that, that I want to show here is that as you increase the misorientation, the amount of rotation decreases. So first of all, you do still do see rotation at 4 degrees. And the reason for that is that at 4 degrees, the, 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 uh, the only thing that changes is not the number of dislocations, but the, the dislocation line length. So the number of dislocations is reasonably conserved as the top and bottom screw networks uh, approach one another. And so you get rotation. Uh, it's not enormous. It's about a degree and a half, but it's still there. Um, at higher misorientations, what happens is that you get uh, the spacing between the dislocations is smaller, so you get more interactions, and that kind of prevents the, uh, the uh, um, reactions, the, the, the rotation. Um, as you decrease the temperature, things begin to change. And so um, those are the areas of function of time at three different temperatures. Um, and that's the rotation at three different temperatures. And what you can see is that um, for, the same for the same rotation, the kinetics changes. Okay, that's kind of what you'd expect. I mean, that, that as you decrease the temperature, uh, the evolution process slows down. Um, uh, I'm sorry, decrease the temperature. The evolution process slows down. So the rate area begins to go slowly. But look at the rotation. The angle of rotation, basically, for the same misorientation, almost goes to a constant, it doesn't change. And so what's happening here is that as you decrease the temperature, the stress associated with the rotation process increases, and at some low temperature, basically the, the, uh, the whole grain growth process can freeze out and not, and not, and not move. So the, the coupling, so basically what it's saying is that for the grain to shrink, it has to rotate because of the coupling between the normal the normal and tangential motion of the grain. At low enough temperatures, if that can't happen because the elastic stress gets too big, the grain, the grain stops moving, basically. And so I've shown you some things about grain growth, grain translation. Um, I didn't mention this, but dislocation climb is clearly important. That's how these grains move at these high temperatures. And then at low temperatures, it shows effects of the, uh, of the uh, oh, I'm sorry shows the effects of the elastic stress or dislocation interactions which basically limit the, the, uh, the uh, uh, grain growth kinetics. But here's some challenges for the community that, that, we're, that they're still out there to be worked on. And so um, if you remember at the very beginning, these dislocations with the, with the shrinking grain, they kind of went radially perpendicular to the, uh, to the grain boundary plane. And that implies that the boundaries, the grain, the dislocations were not moving along slip planes like you would expect, but they're actually climbing. And so that means that there are vacancies in this problem. And the question is, what is the vacancy concentration for that particular simulation I just showed you? And is it, and is it at all realistic? It's kind of an open question. Um, you have to, the, the dynamics of, of uh, uh, solidification and pure materials is still is still kind of an issue. Separating the climb and glide of dislocations, I just discussed uh, a, a little bit. Uh, fluctuations are important. Um, and uh, what kind of fluctuations do I mean here? So if you look at the, 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 the way it was constructed, right, it was just the classic phase field model. And it says that the energy always has to decrease. And um, let me just, uh, this is actually a general it's not only a criticism of this model, but it's a criticism of phase field models of, of all types. Yeah. So, so here we say that the free energy has to decrease um, in order to uh, uh, in order to uh, for order for the evolution to occur. All of the phase field models that we've done have done exactly the same thing, right? The problem is that if you want to worry about nucleation, the energy has to go up. You have to allow for the formation of another phase that increases the energy locally. And that's not in this equation. 
And so what I mean by thermodynamic noise or, or fluctuations is can you add another fluctuation term out here to actually nucleate another phase? And um, that's kind of an open question because, because to get to this, to get to this, um, to get to this equation to begin with, to get to the free energy that we wrote up here, is we made this argument that we averaged out the, the vibrations of the atoms in some sort of fluctuations. And so that, that's kind of a, an open question about what kind of fluctuations can you put in and do they, um, and do they kind of mean anything? Is there a general method for choosing potentials to model a specific uh, material? And, and um, so the idea here is to, um, is to use first principles calculations to tell you what the bond strengths between the atoms are and from that build up a, an energy function for the PFC. And that's been done nicely in some work that's come out of uh, 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 Nick Provatis' group on graphene. And Nick Provatis, I think Ken Elder is also involved in this, where they actually chose the potential consistent with first principles calculations in order to do a PFC model for graphene. Uh, defects is the core structure of the dislocation of nuclei uh, realistic. So um, I have, I showed you that there are dislocations. There are, that, uh, and there are Berger's vectors associated with them, there are dislocation lines. But is the core structure at all realistic? And there's some real controversy in the community about whether that's actually the case. Um, is the dislocation nucleation realistic? That again gets back to these fluctuations. But if you take this, if you take this uh, PFC crystal and you just keep stretching it, it will eventually nucleate dislocations. And the question is, is that dislocation nucleation process and fracture um, at all realistic? And that's, that's, those are kind of uh, open questions. So I think that's it. Yeah. It, that's it. So if there are questions, comments, I'd be happy to take them. It's not at the point where you can actually use this um, easily. It's still something that you have to kind of think about. We're still finding out the strengths and weaknesses of the models, and there are some of the challenges. So any questions, comments? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so in in phase field modeling, um, I can actually just go back because it's the same problem. So, so if you have, um, okay. So, so let's say um, this is this happens to be Swift-Holmberg. Well, let's say this was the Allen Con Con Hilliard equation, right? So you you can put in fluctuations by making this a Langevin equation by you put in random noise here. And a random noise is the fluctuations of atoms about a lattice site. Basically, it models those fluctuations. Um, the problem with putting in a Langevin equation is that you're basically now working on a time scale associated with the fluctuations of the atoms in the crystal, which is essentially like doing molecular dynamics. And so what happens is that when you do a realistic model of the energy of the fluctuations, and you put in a, you put in a fluctuation term here, your time steps go down to nanoseconds. And and you, you, you want to get this, this nucleation process that occurs on seconds, and nothing happens. You basically get a very computationally intractable model. So what people sometimes do is they, they jack up the, they increase the noise to be unrealistically large, and then even then it's hard to get fluctuations to, to nucleate. And so the typical way people take, typical way people do nucleation in the context of a phase field model, let's say the Con Hilliard model, is they'll take a, 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 a sample and then they'll just put particles in the sample of radius equal to the critical radius for nucleation. So the, the, the problem is that this is, this is an equation that's guaranteed that the energy decreases and um, nucleation is a stochastic process that involves increases in the energy locally. Energy still decreases, but local increases. That, that, that it's hard to actually put these two, two things together in a way that's computationally tractable. So that's kind of what people do. They, they calculate the nucleation rate the nucleation rate using classical nucleation theory. It says there's a certain number of, uh, of nuclei per unit volume per unit of time, and they throw particles in at the critical radius, and then let the thing go, which is precisely what we did when we did that nickel aluminum calculation. We started everything off at the critical radius of nucleation and just give little perturbations to allow the particles to start to grow. And it's the same problem with this, too. It's just a generic problem for phase field models. Other questions?
Okay, hearing none, so I guess it's lunchtime. So, or soon. <laughs>